Hey, good evening, everybody. It's so good to see you here. I'm here with Pastor Harry. Yeah, it's good to be here. We've uh, we've been enjoying these sessions coming together and looking in First John and uh, just. If anything, when when we go down this route of discussion, folks, we're learning probably more than you are just because what the Holy Spirit speaks to us. It's been really good. It, you, you know, when when we decided to start studying First John, Pastor Harry asked me, uh, "Why do you want to study First John?" I was like, "Well, I think the Holy Spirit wants us to, but but I think the church needs to hear the message of love too." Yeah, and mm-hmm. and uh, the the unifying that that really comes from that loving of one another. Yeah, but but really, I'm just I I, I love the verse by verse study of this because it a, as we're going through this, we're taking time to pick apart everything, mm-hmm. you you know, and and to hear what the Holy Spirit saying to us. And I feel like this is just such a good uh, study of the Word of God uh, of just taking the time to say. Uh, what does this mean, and and what does God want to say to us? You know, and and so for me, it's been beneficial. It, it has been. I uh, there's different ways of studying the Bible. Sometimes we study by topic, and that's called topographical. In other words, you think of a subject and you you study those verses that talk about that, and that that's a very good study. Um, whether it's like on fear or holiness or um, the Lordship of Christ, you know, those kind of subjects. Mm-hmm. But, but this is more of a expository where we are going verse by verse, looking at each verse. And the neat thing about it is we are learning contextually. We're learning what the Bible says in a sense of context um, of each book because we're looking at the verses surrounding those thoughts. And I, I, this is my favorite way to study, by the way. Yeah, there, there's a really neat theme that that's revealed as you as you work your way through First John that that you see him saying things like, "Well, ch- children, if you love God, then you should love one another." Yeah, you know, and if you're not loving one another, then mm-hmm. the love of God doesn't live in you. You know, but he he's identifying this 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 idea that that love is at the very central part of our relationship with God. You know, I I think back when when John and his brother James uh, they were not received well and and they turned and said Jesus should we call lightning and thunder down upon them? Boy, he has grown a lot from those days, and I think it's because of his being with Jesus and hearing the message of the kingdom, which is that God is love. I mean, that's the truth that we find in this very book, that that declaration is probably the central focus of that book, God is love, and and how John is trying to encourage the church from generation to generation, from age to age, when he wrote this, the ramifications of speaking to us today, I believe that we're living in the end times, and if there's ever a need for a motivation today, it is love. It is realizing that we obey because of loving God, not because of, you know, some militant thing in our head that I've got to do this. But it's 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 the sense of loving God and him drawing us in his love where we want to do the things that he shows us to do. And so this is this is very timely. I think it's a good study. First John is a wonderful book to study about God's character and kingdom. We live in a day and age where uh, in, on many levels relationships are broken and mm-hmm. this this book challenges us to take our commitment to relationships to the next level mm-hmm. and and to, to not fall into the the divisiveness and, and the things we see happening in the world around us mm-hmm. I, I I took a picture of, of a dog that was wandering the neighborhood near, near my house uh, last week. And it, it was it was down the street. Um, actually, it ran up to me and then mm-hmm. ran away. And I thought, oh, I should take a picture of it when it's close. And then it wasn't coming back, so I put my phone down. And then it ran up, ran up to me again. This went like two or three times. And each time it ran up to me, I didn't have my phone up. It was photo shy. It, it was. So finally, I'm like, I'm just going to take the picture while it was down the street. And, yeah. and uh, I thought... There's probably, it was a really hot day, and there's probably some owner out there, because they had a collar on, mm-hmm. just wondering where their dog is. So I went and I put it on the Geneva um, Facebook page, mm-hmm. and uh, 
you, you know that that post got shared like 30 or 40 times really yeah. and uh because there's lots of people that are like let's get the word out there mm-hmm. somebody will find their mm-hmm. dog and now it was a distant shot it was a boxer so it was a kind of a skinny dog anyway mm-hmm. yeah and and there were there were a couple of people that jumped on there and and complained about well that dog looks emaciated you know like like really like disgruntled kind of comments towards mm-hmm. like you know those those owners should be disciplined or something like that huh, interesting and, yeah and i'm like okay first of all i saw that dog up close and it was not emaciated yeah it was just out for a, a, a joy ride it was mm-hmm. <laughs> it was having a good time and i you know the picture was a little farther away so i understand maybe why they thought that but like the uh it, it's just interesting to me how people's handling of relationships mm-hmm. it's really changed in the last few years and, and people people are, can be very aggressive and critical about opinionated. things yeah opinionated mm-hmm. about things in ways that just sometimes surprise me you, you know and and I, I think things have transformed a lot in our world maybe because of social media maybe because of technology um, the the way people handle relationships has, has sure. changed. And there's things yeah. that have been, become normal that really they shouldn't be normal. And I, I think in in what First John uh, tells us is is that this is a challenge for me as as a person mm-hmm. to to work harder at how I love people, to, to to tolerate the mistakes of others, to 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 push beyond that and stay faithful to relationships with people, even to the point of of trying to trying to fix relationships where it's it's really really easy to be like i just wash my hands of a relationship and move on yeah i i think that if anything what we do is we let the word of god be absolute in a standard of our thinking and motivation and way that we operate because the opinions of the world well they shift back and forth so many times and and just in the history that i've had um being in my 60s close to 70 is that is that the opinions of our world have shifted so radically back and forth. And it's it's easy to get caught up into that dynamic and begin to operate in that. And it's important for us as God's people to realize we have a standard, and that standard is what the Word of God says, what God says to us through the Holy Spirit as we read the Word and we're inspired as we listen to the Holy Spirit really give commentary to our life. It's a wonderful thing when you read the Word of God. And and as you read it, the Holy Spirit begins to apply it to specific things that you're dealing with in your life. And you go, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, I needed that. And and uh, other times when you go, yeah, you're right. I've I've not been good in that area. Forgive me. And, and other places you go, wow, Holy Spirit, that, praise God, that's what I did, you know? And, and there's... There's such a, a, a steadiness and a hope that comes to us uh, to live this way rather than trying to exist in a world that is convulsing back and forth. I, we were just talking about this before we got started, and I believe we're living in the end days. I believe that we're living in the time of the book of Revelation where we're seeing things shape and develop like never before. That, are, that have great potential hmm. of, of being the ushering in of, of the Antichrist and the one world system and all of those things. Uh, and, and I don't even want to get into that. But just if that's the case, how much more important it is for me and you and everybody that's watching to make sure that we do not get deceived. One of the things that the Bible says is because deception increases, many warnings throughout the book of Revelation, be not deceived, you know, uh, don't be persuaded. Um, and, and then it tells us that that because of the deception that's out there, that the love of many will grow cold because of lawlessness. They don't have the law of God in their heart, the kingdom of God in their heart. And I believe it's because of our direct dependence upon reading the word of God daily, you know, and allowing the Holy Spirit to really speak it to our heart. So I'm very thankful that we have this time together to uh, to consider one of the, uh, I believe, premier end time prophets. If anybody knew 
uh, uh, the mind of God in what was going to happen in the latter days. I think John was one of those, just with him be being used by God to write the book of Revelation. I think that he yeah. he had a grasp much more than what we read about John when he was in the Gospels. He had really grown up. <laughs> yeah. He certainly understood what we needed to hear yeah. in this day and age. Yeah. And as, as we're looking today, today we're going to talk about First John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, mm -hmm. um, which you might wonder, why are we talking about end times? Well, verses 2 and 3 of chapter 3 uh, touch into some end time prophecy. Mm -hmm. And so let, let's go ahead and read it. Um, so First John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what, we'll, what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Now, the him he's talking about is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then verse 3 says, And everyone who, who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Mm -hmm. And as, as we're looking at this, one, one of the things that, that comes out in here is that there is going to be a reappearance of Jesus. When, when he, he's going to come back and those who are God's children are going to see him. And what, what, we, what we know from that is, is we call this the rapture, mm -hmm. that there's going to be a reappearance of Jesus and, and the children of God. There's different scriptures that talk about how, how those who are alive will rise to meet him in the air. And those who, who have died already um, will have returned with him as well all, all these things are happening at the same time um but but he he mentions that that uh, uh we don't exactly know what this looks like mm -hmm. because uh we will be or what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we're going to be like him so john was basically trying to to deal with a, a, a quandary that he dealt with and probably the church deals with is, so what are we going to look like? Yeah. What kind of bodies are we going to have? And John was just saying, I don't know, but because of who Jesus is, because of what he has done for us, uh, verse, verse one says, see how great a love the father has bestowed on us that we are called children of God. And as such, we are for this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. And then he goes in talking about really the rapture of the church. Mm -hmm. And he's, he is addressing us as children of God. And he, he realizes that we can only be known in the flesh right now, but then we will be known in the spirit and we will yes. see Jesus in the spirit, not in the flesh. And, and he's basically saying, I, I'm not sure what it's going to look like. But, but we're going to be like Jesus. Absolutely. And, you, you know, the, the apostles had some experience with Jesus in his resurrected flesh. Mm -hmm. They ate with him. They touched him. And some of them didn't even recognize him until he made himself known to them. Yeah, because he was transformed. Yeah. He was changed. Yeah. And so there's, there's, there's a, an excitement that we can have of, wow, the day is coming when all of these things that we see with our eyes, that we touch, that we that we smell and hear, all of those things will be completely transformed because our spiritual sense will become even greater than our physical sense. You know, Don and I talked this morning about this, this piece of flesh right here is dying. And we will not see God in this form of flesh, but we will see him and uh, we will be like him, just as it says in this verse. Now, and, you're not dying rapidly, by the way. You know, no, I'm, I'm, He's going to live a long time, in case you're questioning that. I'm, I'm aging well. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's, the, but, but all of our lives, we focus on our physical being. And yep. John is helping us to say, wait, there's a whole different focus that we will have. And that is, looking through spiritual eyes, seeing Jesus as he really is. And we're going to be like that. I I, th I think I, I joked one time with, I think one of your daughters one time, mm -hmm. maybe 10 years ago, when I was a lot more immature than I am now, um, <laughs> uh, about, you know, like, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm dying. <laughs> 
And, and I seem to remember hearing later that that she, she asked one of her sisters or something like that. What, what's wrong with David? Is something wrong? <laughs> oh, you thought she was really dying like right then. Yeah. And, and uh, I had to tell her, no, I was just joking. I just meant that, hey, they, they say our bodies keep growing until some point in our 20s. And then we, yeah. as we're getting older, our bodies are slowly dying. <laughs> I remember a pastor's wife being given a diagnosis that she only had so much time to live. And she's outlived that now. Because doctors only practice medicine. They're not the real thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. Pra doctors are wonderful, but they don't know everything. And uh, somebody walked up to this pastor's wife at the church when they found out she got this diagnosis. And she looks at her and says, oh, I'm so sorry that you're dying. And the pastor's wife looked at her and said, so are you. <laughs> <laughs> and we we lose sight of that. We yeah. We don't realize that this outward man is perishing, but yeah. the, but the inward person, the spiritual person, is growing each day. Yeah, our our flesh is finite, mm -hmm. but you know, but our, our spirit there's a there's a sense of infinity, absolutely immortal, the, the, the yeah. infinite mm -hmm. connected to our spirit, and, and that's what this is touching. That's what's so cool about this. That John's giving a wonderful hope to the church. He is a wonderful hope. Yeah. That there's this eternal part of our being that he's saying when jesus comes we're going to be transformed we're going to be like him yeah we don't exactly understand or, or know what that's like but we saw him so we know it's going to happen mm -hmm. and we're going to rise we're going to meet him we're going to be like him and we're going to see him as he is and and this was not an optional thing it says we know when he appears why did john have that certainty because jesus told him that when he resurrected, you know, mm -hmm. and w before he left his disciples and ascended, he told them, be prepared, be ready. I am coming back again. And yep. and so there's that surety that this witness of Jesus's death and resurrection with his own eyes, with his own mind, with, with all that he perceived in the physical realm, knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was coming back again. And we know that when he appears, and so there was absolute surety that he was passing on to the church. You and do you know why they, they could trust that that was true? Because Jesus had died too. Yeah. And he rose from the grave. Right. And they saw him. They touched his body. They saw him hanging on the cross. Absolutely. They saw yeah. him die. They saw that soldier come up and pierce him in the side. Mm -hmm. And and they they saw him be put into the tomb. And then three days later, the tomb was empty. Oh, yeah. And, and then and he appeared to them and he spent up to 40 days with with them. Mm -hmm. And and they knew that this was that this was a reality and this was a hope that we could have. And was, they literally touched his body. Yeah. The, Jesus said, come here, come here, Thomas. Feel these nail prints. Feel the wound in my side. I mean, it was it was as real as knocking on this table. Yep. But they, it was a spiritual body. That's right. They, they yeah. watched him eat. Yeah. And, and the food didn't just go in his mouth and then fall through his body and land on the floor. <laughs> you, you know, like he had a, a yeah. new flesh that, that he'd been given. And, and they watched him appear in their midst and then disappear uh -huh. they watched him ascend to heaven and scratching their heads and the angels that appeared and said why what why are you looking in the sky don't you know he's going to come back again and so there was this 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 real revelation this physical revelation that they had of jesus coming back again and so we are we are inheritors of that same confidence and mm -hmm. boldness and 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 just being able to say yes, he is he is coming up back. It, folks, uh, years ago there was a time in my life, even after accepting the Lord, where I just said, "Is this a mind trip? Is this really real?" I mean, I, I it just because I I was so taken back by the by the apparent change of my life and and thinking, you know that I. I, it was almost like, is this real? You know, is this? And I, and I, and I, it wasn't that I was questioning my faith. I was, I was wanting to verify it. I mean, mm -hmm. the, just the radical transformation. And, and when I walked through that time, I realized, you know, as real and as sure as the sun rises from the east and it sets in the west, that's how real and sure I am of God's promises that He is who He says He is. And if anything, 
the evidence has been building up even greater. So I'm in this point in my life, I'm very excited about Jesus coming back. Do I know it all? No. Nope. And there is some apprehension about what's it going to look like and, and you know, how's it all going to work out? And, and I was just telling my son last night, you know, um, you know, God just wants you to know, I got this covered. Don't worry about it. I got it covered. And, and so I've been able to, to rest in this, this word that God gives of, I got it covered. It's okay. I am God, the creator of heaven and earth, and I got this covered. And that's in a sense what John is saying here. God's got it covered. He knows what you're going to look like. Yeah. <laughs> And he's writing to a church who is going through a lot of struggles, too. Oh, yeah. This period of time when, when John wrote this letter, you know, the, the church was being persecuted. They were going through a lot of difficulties. Fleeing for their lives. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Greek term diaspora, they were literally um, flushed out from their homes and sent because of persecution. Yeah. And settling and then maybe persecution again and having to go again. So they were... They were, they were wanderers and uh, really couldn't trust the world, the things that they held on to. You know, as much as they could hold on to their jewelry or clothing, just that easily could be taken away from them. Yeah, you know, John does a good job of, of giving us a, a fresh perspective of hope. Yeah. Because it, it's, it's so easy for us to just be like, man, I've been praying so hard that God would give me a home help me pay my bills and praying so hard that God would help me be healthy. And it, I wonder if sometimes we think that that's the hope, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that God will do this and God will do that in our life. And sure, I hope for that. You know, I, I want to see those things happen in my life. And I, I think scripture promises that God, and as God a husband and father, you know, yeah. you, those are very active, real hopes that, yeah. that you can look to God for and any, any blesses, but that's not where we stay. Yeah, all of those hopes, that those are those are benefits mm -hmm. of what he's talking about here. Yeah. That we we can know God as our father. I mean, mm -hmm. he calls us children of God. We're God's yeah. children now. Yeah. And because of that, we we have a foundational hope that Jesus is coming back to get us. Hallelujah. And to take us home. Yeah. And, and what good news is that? That's something that I can look forward to. And because of that. I can define the rest of my life by that hope. I, yeah. I can make my plans according to that hope. I, I can plan my time according to that hope. You know, when, when I think back to my, my pre-Jesus days, I, I, I did a lot of things with my time that were basically designed to pursue my pleasures. Mm -hmm. You know, one way or another, I was pursuing my desires and my pleasures, and that's I mean, I really didn't have much more to live for, you know. That was your framework back then. It was. Mm -hmm. And if you if you're not living for the hope of to be found in Jesus, I mean, really what more is there? I mean, your pleasure might be to to pour yourself into your job or to to have a big boat. Or, so your hope back then was just enjoyment. Or or to try. Yeah, yeah. You My know? hope is that I can be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something like that, you know. I don't want to suffer. I want to I want to have some nice things. I want to be successful, you know, kind of all revolves kind of around the same thing of, I just want to try to have a good life and I don't really have much more to hope for. But, but when Jesus came into my life, he, he, he took my hope off of those things and put it on something else. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden those other things became a little less meaningful to me. And I mean, they're still important, sure. Mm -hmm. But, but the thing of greatest importance was the fact that, I can live for God. I can look forward to a future point where I'm going to be united with Jesus for all of eternity. Mm -hmm. And and all of the struggles and frustrations and, and um, you, you know, the, all the striving that we do in life to try to achieve things, all of those things, they're going to be insignificant because the most important thing is that, that I'm going to be united with Jesus. You know, we both had a friend, Harry Hunt, and when he was in his middle 70s, he would laugh and say, you know, when I grow up, I'm not quite sure what I want to be yet. And, <laughs> and, and it was good hearing that perspective because it's so easy for us to get locked into an immature hope that says, when I get to this age, I'm going to have this and this and this and this. And, and we, we live for that expectation 
And many times it doesn't show up and, and we, we lose motivation. We lose, um, a sense of purpose and, uh, and, and we start living by um, little spikes of happiness, you know, mm. with, with whatever it is. And, 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 I, and I see this process that God wants us to go through of immature hope to mature hope. And that immature hope is just immature hope. It's, not, it, it's just the way it is. We're, we're flesh-oriented. And what God does is he helps us grow to the place where we're, where we're more and more spirit-oriented because our hope has matured to where we don't settle on, you know, someday I'm going to have a X amount of house, you know, and, and I'm going to have X amount of land. I'm going to have this, 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 and this, it, those things begin to be put in proper perspective. And I've known some very rich people who, who have been older and they've gotten to the point of saying, these things mean nothing to me with now the life I have in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And, and they began to invest themselves into the kingdom things and expending their wealth for kingdom things. And it brought much more uh, satisfaction and enjoyment because their hope was fixed on something eternal, mm -hmm. not temporary. Yeah. And so I think that, that God helps us to grow to the point where, where we get our focus like you off of the temporary things and more on the eternal things, our, our matured hope, so to speak. And that's, that's what I think John is talking about here is, 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 is the motivation of being like Jesus. Yeah. And verse three kind of goes into that. But I want to read a scripture here. And it might have been that one you were going to, I don't know if you're going to read Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And that's Paul writing that. And he wrote that from prison. You yeah. know, I mean, it was absolute. It's when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be, it isn't, you might be like him, you will be revealed with him in glory. You know, one of the neat things he says in there is that Christ, who is our life. Yeah. And, and he wasn't saying that when he's revealed, he'll be our life. Christ, who now is our life, Exactly. When he's revealed, I mean, he's talking about this rapture. Right. But right now, he's our life. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that ties in really well to this concept sure. of uh, mm -hmm. everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself because he's pure. Right. Like, we find our hope in the fact that Jesus is our life now. Mm -hmm. It's I, I think it's a maturing of hope. It's where we get our eyes off of the physical things that are temporary. And Paul says that very well in 1 Corinthians. The things that we see are temporary and the things we don't see are eternal. But it helps us to begin to, to fix our hope on something that is eternal mm -hmm. rather than temporary. Listen, people can fix their hope on, I've got a bank account, I've got a car or cars, I've got a home. And, and people in different parts of the world have watched all of that be gone and nothing. I mean, whether it's a raging forest fire or the, th the collapse of a government or a financial institution, and suddenly they're with nothing. Yeah, all sorts of natural disasters. Yeah, yeah. things that can happen. And I, mm -hmm. I think what God wants for his people is to make sure that we're tethered to an eternal hope rather than a temporary hope. And, and that's a process. You know, I, I think that when I was younger, my goal and thoughts were, you know, I'd like to have a house for my family. I'd like to have that sense of security, you know. And There's nothing wrong with that. No, it yeah. isn't. And uh, I want to make sure I can mm -hmm. feed my family and put a roof over their head and that kind of thing. And, and God's been so good at taking care of that. But the thing that has happened is, is, is I've grown to the point of realizing that it's not what I can do, but it's in what he can do. Yeah. And my ability to trust him, even in those times where maybe I don't see it happening the way that I think it ought to work. <laughs> yeah. And that's not easy sometimes. No, it's not. You know, but th that, that scripture in Colossians uh, brings a wonderful perspective to this context, this mm -hmm. element of the fact that we know he's coming back. Mm -hmm. And because of that, that there's a, an urgency and an expectation that, that we look forward to that because he's coming back, that I'm going to, I'm going to live my life in a way that is worthy of, of his calling and his presence in our life. Yes. And that, you know, him, him saying that, that Christ who is our life is, is so, 
so descriptive, mm -hmm. you know, that, that Jesus is becoming our life. You, you, you know, this last weekend, uh, Angelina and I spent some time with our launch leaders on, on Saturday afternoon and, and their families. And, and one of the things that I appreciated about that, if you don't know what are the, the launch leaders are, is, is we have a group of, of, uh, of people in our church who, who we're working with and we're discipling them and, and teaching them what it means to be spiritual parents, spiritual mothers mm -hmm. and fathers, uh, and, and with, and teaching them that the, Hey, God designed us to raise spiritual children. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's essentially what discipleship is, 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 is taking people and helping them to become part of the family of God mm -hmm. and teaching them how to grow up and mature in faith and to make, more, you know, more spiritual children. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what families do? That's right. Yeah. You know, and we, we spent the afternoon with them and, uh, um, and their families. And it, it was, it was so neat. Just the, the, the presence of God in, in that fellowship and in that, that connection mm -hmm. and just how there was this sense of the Holy Spirit as we're working on some of the family part of discipleship mm -hmm. and, and being spiritual parents how how the life of God just just flowed through mm -hmm. through those relationships and how how th that that just helps me think about you know when when God when God talks uh, he gives us these instructions about how Jesus is supposed to be our life and and we we come together and and our focus changes you know I, I can I can invest my time in something like that mm -hmm. and and understand that I'm doing the ministry of God. I, I'm living for the Lord simply in just the development of these relationships. Yeah. And and I'm able to see the life of God appearing and, and flowing through that. Whereas at a different point in my life, I don't I don't think that, that would have been that wouldn't have been my focus. It it probably would not have at that point in your life brought you the satisfaction you were looking for right because you were tuned a different way yeah, it, that, yeah. that's a good word it's mm -hmm. just a totally different type of satisfaction mm -hmm. that I, I realize that man this fellowship these connections and these relationships that we're building as mm -hmm. we work at being spiritual parents is building this family that it's just is a whole different type of satisfaction and that's that's what john is writing about here he is saying there's a whole different motivation that, that you can have. And that motivation is, is that there's a hope we have that is eternal. And because of fixing our hope on him, Jesus, that we begin to operate in that motivation of hope by being pure, by being like Jesus. I, 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 liked, uh, I was looking at a verse of scripture here that uh, in Romans, uh, it's such a cool scripture. This is Romans 8, 25. For those whom he foreknew, yes. speaking of God, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. In other words, God's design and purpose is for us to be just like Jesus so that um, he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And so there is a purpose in in becoming a child of God, and that is becoming like the rest of the family. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Jesus is the best example yeah. that we're being conformed into the image of Jesus. And so whatever we walk through, whatever situation, whatever pickle we find ourselves in, we don't have to go, what in the world's going on? I know we do. I do. <laughs> but I can go, wait, 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 wait. Okay, God all things work together for good because it says that in Romans just, just earlier or later than that, you know, three verses later. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there's a, a mindfulness of, of purpose. And, you know, when we are born into the family of God, there is a process of maturing and development that begins to take place in our life. And we have a choice every day. We can either reject that process and purpose and go, nope, I'm done with this, God. I want to do my own thing. Or we can embrace it and say, not my will, but thy will be done. And, and as we hold on to that and say, God, I'm raggedy. Um, I don't have it together. I'm not like that person over there that seems to be spiritual. But here I am. Uh, let me be used. And as we, as we realize it's not what we do, but what God does in us as we're available to him, he makes us more and more 
uh, in the image of his son, Jesus. Isn't that amazing yeah. that that we become just like Jesus? And, and I have to say, you know, I look back at a time where I was completely opposite anything that Jesus stood for because of where I was at in my life. And God rescued me. He loved me and, and, and motivated me to the point now where it's, I don't want to do my own thing. I want to do the things of God. And the times that I begin to get selfish, the Holy Spirit just brings that check in my spirit where I go, oh, man, I don't, you know, something isn't right. Mm -hmm. You know, I may not know what it is, but something isn't right. And that's, mm -hmm. I'll stop and many times say, Holy Spirit, what is it? Is there, what is it in my life that I need to adjust? What do I need? And, and in a sense, that's what John is talking about, that there is a walk of purifying, you know, or it, it's purposing. It's, it's, it's saying, this is my operation to purify. Um, I want to be just like Jesus. You know, it's, it's that, um, that focus that we begin to live for rather than I want to be rich like that p person or I want to be uh, as physically built as that person or I want to have this type of in industriousness in my life as that person. It's, all of those things may be good, but they're not the best because then we begin to say, no, I want to be just like Jesus. Whatever that means in my life, that's what I want. So Jesus should be our hero. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you know, when I first became a Christian, I, I I think the first thing that grabbed my grabbed my attention about God was that I just I recognized that there was a sense of family among the believers, mm -hmm. and that 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 really stirred my heart. Mm -hmm. But then, like, I started to realize that God could influence my life. Yeah. And, and God could help me become more than I've ever been. And and that that meant. That, that that there was this hope that that he could transform my present reality, mm -hmm. um, and and as he worked at transforming my present reality, he slowly shifted my my focus off of my present, in into looking into the future that God has has for us, mm -hmm. you know. And I I think one one of the things in this is is as I work at purifying myself, and that 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 to me means learning to be who Jesus wants me to be mm -hmm. and, and being that, you know, and that's something we take a day at a time, yeah. you know, we, we learn yeah. and then we learn some more and then we learn some more. Sure. And as I've lived my life trying to purify myself, I, I find that even though I'm certainly not perfect and I certainly haven't figured everything out yet, but I, I find that the, the more I, I, I look for what Jesus wants for me, the more I find satisfaction from, from, living life and, and, and my satisfaction comes out from outside of myself, mm -hmm. so to speak. It, it, I, I don't need Jesus to come in and fix this little problem in my life in order for me to be satisfied yeah. because and that doesn't mean that he doesn't come in and help with those things, but it, I, I'm starting to de derive my satisfaction in living by, by finding that I I'm serving the will and serving the purposes of God as mm -hmm. I, as I've worked at purifying my life, I, I strive to uh, put myself on God's path and start living for his purposes. I, I heard uh, a pastor out in Denver talk about master's commission students, which we are, were a part of at one time. Uh, and, and it was tr the training of young people. And they, they capsulized the process of that and that was they said you know we're helping these young people to live for something bigger than themselves and i think that whenever we live for ourselves we limit the potential that we can come up to we do you know it's like well i i'm going to accomplish this and we accomplish it but god has so much more that we can accomplish if we'll live for something bigger than ourselves and that is living for god who is huge you know is enormous and and uh there's no end to what he can do through a person uh, who is living for him I, I like what mary said nothing is impossible with god you know i mean when she was called upon to 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 bear the child you know being a virgin she understood there was some ramifications to that and consequences i mean joseph himself was ready to put her aside quietly so there was there was always those thoughts that they both had to deal with. And, and yet Mary's 
Mary's uh, declaration was nothing is impossible with God. And, yeah. and uh, that can be our motivation. You know, God, I got things in my life that maybe aren't looking good right now, but nothing is impossible for you. Or, or God, I'm in this pickle right now, this predicament, and I don't think it's going to end very good, but nothing is impossible with you. And and uh, if we limit ourselves to only what we can do, we, we will be uh, um, minimalists, I guess. You know, we will minimize the potential we have or we'll fall into that malaise of saying, this is all I can do. This is it. I can't do anymore. But if we live and say, God, I've come to my, into my ability and strength. Would you now become my sufficiency in that? And Paul said it well. He said, you know, I sought the Lord three times about this weakness, but God said, ain't happening, Paul. I mean, that's my paraphrase. And Paul said uh, he came to the conclusion of realizing that, that God was sufficient, that my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. And, and Paul came to the conclusion that I'll glory in my weaknesses because when I'm weak, he is strong. Uh -huh. And and the only way that you can grasp a hold of the understanding of that is to get into the dilemma where You've come to the end of your rope. That's a dangerous place to be because you're no longer in charge. You're no longer in control. And that's where God says, okay, now watch what I can do. I got this. Watch what I can do. And 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 as we release it to God, he expands our ability to see things in a completely different way. That's a wonderful thing. Oh, it sure is. Yeah. You know, we start to dream Jesus dreams. Yes, and, and that's and a wonderful thing. It is. We start to have mm -hmm. Jesus' hopes. So yeah. If, if Jesus is our life, then then how is he transforming the everyday things that we do? Yeah. It, you know, are, are, are we living a David life, or are we living a Harry life, mm -hmm. or are we living a Jesus life? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, what, did Paul write mm -hmm. that when he was in prison, right? In Colossians mm -hmm. was, a, was one of his prison epistles. And, man, he's sitting in prison saying, Christ is my life. He wasn't sitting there pining away, wishing that he was somewhere else. Yep. I mean, maybe he had those moments, I'm sure. But yeah. but he knew Christ was his life. And, Absolutely. And, and he was on this, this journey of yeah. faith, of following Jesus. And he certainly didn't find his satisfaction in his present conditions. No. And, you know, John, in a sense, says this in verse 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him, you yeah. know, it isn't just hope in general. It's uh -huh. hope fixed on Jesus, yeah. you know, purifies himself. You know, as we look at Jesus, we realize there's such a better way that he wants us to live. Yeah. And and that causes us to begin to, to operate in a much more purified motivation. Mm -hmm. And, ah, that's good enough. No, it's not good enough. You know, God is calling me to something to be the best that I can do. Yeah. And it's as we fix our hope on Jesus and see his life, it, it, we really begin to operate in the sense of, I can do this through Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And and those things that drew me back, those weaknesses, those temptations, those things in my life, I don't have to do them anymore because Christ can be my strength and sufficiency. You know, both of us dealt with addictive lifestyles. How did we overcome that? The more we looked at Jesus, the more we hoped in Jesus. It wasn't what we could do. It was what he could do in us. That yeah. That's what changed us. Yeah, what, a, right. what a wonderful, hallelujah, yeah. moment that is that we come to when we realize, Jesus, you can do anything you want in my life and through me. You know, the, the, the final straw on, on the proverbial camel's back of, of alcoholism for me mm -hmm. was... I read in the scripture one day and God spoke through the scripture and, and told me that you can have more drunkenness or you can have more of me. You just, you really can't have both. Yeah. And, and, and it wasn't just an out, you know, out of the blue uh, mm -hmm. revelation. Uh, he had built within me up to that point, a, a desire that was building mm -hmm. for him where when he told me that, all of a sudden I realized that, man, I want Jesus more than I want this. Mm -hmm. And and he gave he empowered me. He gave me the power to walk away from alcohol once and for all. Hallelujah. Yeah. And praise Jesus. He did it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a work in my flesh because I tried to quit before. 
<laughs> and and I couldn't. Yeah. But when he told me that, I realized I choose you, Jesus. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I, I was set free. And I had this hope in Jesus that I could live a free life. Hallelujah. And, and that's the same hope he offers to all of us mm-hmm. in different forms and different fashions that that he is offering a life where Jesus can be our life, mm-hmm. that, where we don't have to be hindered, we don't have to be held back by the, the many different things in our life that we wish were different. We all have those things. That I wish I could be free from this thing or that thing. and So and that we realize we don't have any limitations in Christ. We don't. Yeah. When Jesus comes in, he starts to, to bring his limitless nature yeah into our being and interesting because we say limitless but there really is some limits in, in a mm-hmm. sense because uh his limitless nature ho- operates within this world of purity in the kingdom of heaven and there'll come a time where our limitlessness mm-hmm. will no longer need this physical body <laughs> right it, it, it won't need sin to feel satisfied that's it right won't, mm-hmm. it won't need all the the accoutrements of worldliness yeah and this flesh, in order to feel satisfied, mm-hmm. it'll be totally satisfied in Jesus. Hallelujah! And we yeah. we're already partially there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like like we you know we see in a mirror dimly. The scripture talks That's about. Right. Yeah. We we get this picture. We 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 have this glimpse of this totally satisfying hope. That, that that's coming we get to participate in it in part now mm-hmm. and so it's already starting to happen in the flesh yeah and yeah. and i am loving experiencing that in the flesh i have difficult days i yeah. have great days but even yeah. in the difficult days yeah. i'm able to love this hope and and this 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 relationship i have with jesus and this is something that you can have Absolutely. I, uh, the kind of the picture in my mind was my wife being pregnant so many times is, is there was a, there was a course of direction that my wife's body took and it got to the point where it was no longer her controlling her body. Her body was controlling her. The pregnancy was, Mm -hmm. and I can remember when she got down to the wire in the um, labor time where she says, I don't want to do this anymore. Let's go home. I said, I don't think that's going to happen, sweetie. It works like that, right? <laughs> and, and she was forced to go through the complete birthing of that child, whether she wanted to or not. Mm-hmm. And I think that God, in a sense, does that with us. We are pregnant with a spiritual life. Yeah. And, and there will come a time of labor and delivery where we will be birthed into this spiritual being that John here is talking about, you know, we're going to be like Jesus. We are, we are going to put on that spiritual body and we are going to get rid of this physical body and wonder what a, what a wonderful thing to look forward to. And as we look forward to it, to be just like Jesus, that it causes us now to say, okay, then I need to operate in my life much like a pregnant woman, she can't eat for herself anymore. She can't do the things that she'd like to do. She has to start living for the baby. Yeah. And in a sense, that's what we do is we start living for this spiritual baby that we're getting, getting ready to be birthed into how wonderful it is that, that God helps us to grow more and more to the point where we realize there's so much more than just what we see in this world today. There's so much more. And and he takes he takes the proper steps of helping us grow to the point of appreciating that. I don't think I would have appreciated where I'm at today if if I wouldn't have had those small incremental steps of maturity to bring me to the point that I'm at now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Motion Sinarain sent me a scripture this morning. Mm-hmm. <coughs> And I think it's really appropriate right now. So let's read it and and let's close out our discussion here. Isaiah 43, uh, verses 18 and 19. It says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Don't you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And and think about this. Mm -hmm. When, When we set our hope on Jesus... We take our hope off of, uh, or our focus off of all this stuff in the world. When we set our hope on Jesus, he's able to do that. Mm-hmm. Where he says, you know, stop thinking about the former things. Don't don't 
focus on the things of old because I'm doing a new thing in your life. Mm -hmm. I, I can cause paths to appear in the wilderness and rivers to appear in the desert, mm -hmm. you know, and God does that. And spiritually speaking, our life was a wilderness and it was a desert. Mm -hmm. But but when we set our hope on Jesus, he's able to come into the middle of that desert and cause there to be water. Yeah. And he's he, and in that 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 lost place of wilderness, he's able to uh, create a path mm -hmm. so we know the way to go. And so he's able to come in and and if we'll stop focusing on the old life and start saying Jesus has a new life. Yeah. So let's go on an adventure mm -hmm. and discover this new life mm -hmm. and start purifying our life so that we we start bringing in the things of of Jesus's life and we we stop living for that old stuff and we start living for the new things that we discover in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, we're, I Go ahead. We're able to put that all behind us. Yeah, and I, I think that what the enemy's tactics are is to get us to focus on our failures. And what we have to do is focus on the success of Jesus, his victories, mm -hmm. because those are our victories. God has already predis predispositioned every one of us who has accepted his son to become just like Jesus. That's that's God's plan for us. And so there's nothing that can revoke that except us saying, I can't do it. You know, well, of course you can't do it. Jesus in you can do it. And that's where our strength and hope has to lie is in yeah. keeping it on Jesus. Maybe it becomes I won't do it. Yeah. Because really we can. Well, we become an excuse to ourselves. We do. <laughs> we do. And, and I, I just want to ask you, you know, where you're at today. What things does the Lord have in store for you? Where have we been looking into our past and letting our past hold us back from just discovering this wonderful world of, of living in Jesus that, that God has for you? And, and I, I want to ask you to consider offering your life to Jesus tonight. And maybe you've never done that before. You know, may, maybe, uh, maybe you've been on the outskirts of faith and perhaps... You really haven't given a, a true consideration to letting Jesus uh, become your way of life. And I, I want to ask you to consider that tonight, that, that you, would, you would offer your life wholly and completely to Jesus. Yes. And, and also, as we're considering this, uh, some of you, perhaps you, you have known about Jesus for a while, but you've got things going on in your life that they're just holding you back. And and you you've been you've been skirting these issues for a long time, but you still you still have this stuff in life that you just can't seem to get your focus off of. And I want to encourage you, as we just read in Isaiah, to stop focusing on the things of the old life, but set your hope on Jesus, because Jesus came so that you could have freedom. Jesus came so that those things would not control you anymore. Uh, Jesus came so that in the midst of all of that stuff, man, you can have good life. Just like we, we read about Paul writing from prison, mm -hmm. and he's just declaring the wonders of God. When he was in a place where he, he might have been tempted to say, man, I'm following God, and look what happened to me. Yeah, and that I'm sure was a temptation. It, it probably and, I mean, was. Probably threw that into his life. And I and I, I suspect there's somebody saying, you know, since I started following Jesus, life has gotten really hard. You're right. It does. Because you're like the fish swimming upstream. You're going against the flow of this world. This world's end is destruction. But when God calls us to himself, he changes us. And it is work. It is hard work to operate by the kingdom of God. But it's 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 a rewarding and fulfilling work because it, it does, through Christ, become easier and easier to live for him. So you may be struggling with an impurity tonight where you're just saying, I can't overcome this thing. You're probably right. You can't, but Christ can through you overcome that thing. And so whenever you begin to fall into that thing that's impure, say, no, I, Christ, you're my strength. You're my hope. I can do all things through you and begin to operate in his strength instead of your own. And and don't focus on the failure of the impurity. Focus on Jesus's victory over every sin that's in the world today. That's that's where we gain that sense of perspective that, you know, I'm not stuck in this thing. Christ will get me out of this. I don't have to live this way. Dave, Pastor David and I are both testimonies of 
addictive lifestyles that were set free because we put our hope in Jesus Christ and his strength and ability to bring freedom into our lives. Not what we could do or live as a more perfect person. No, it's, it's what Jesus did in us to make us more like him, giving us the strength and the authority to be able to say, no, nope, I don't have to give into that anymore. I, I can live just like Jesus wants me to live. So hallelujah. We should pray. Huh? We, we should. So join us in prayer and ask, ask mm -hmm. Jesus to come in and become your life. Amen. And it, it's as simple as that. There, there's no like magical formula or anything like that. This is Jesus. This is God. And he wants to participate in your life. And you simply ask. Yes. The, the, the scriptures tell us that all we have to do to be saved is to believe in the gospel. Believe in Jesus, the mm -hmm. Son of God. And it, it all starts there. And if you believe, he'll come in and he'll take up residence in your life. Amen. And he'll start helping you. He'll start working with you. He'll start helping you to, to, to start shifting your eyes off of the past. So I want you to pray with us that, that Jesus will come in and shift your eyes off the past and set your eyes on his hope. Man. So Jesus, I just ask you right now that you'd speak to the hearts of the people who are listening, that, that, that they would hear your call deep in their innermost being and that they, that they would answer you and invite you to come into their lives. And, and to take up residence there. Lord, for that person who ha has been considering whether or not they're supposed to invite you to come into their lives, perhaps for the first time, uh, Lord, we just pray that you would just uh, reaffirm in their mind uh, that, that you love them and that you're calling them and you're speaking to them directly right now at this very moment that, that it, it's for them that we're having this conversation right now, mm -hmm. that you ordained this so that they would hear about how much you want to be involved in their life. And uh, uh, if, if you're listening and that's you, I, I just want to say a prayer for you. You can pray along with me. Um, and we're going to just in, invite Jesus to come in and take up residence and, and become the way of life. So, uh, Lord Jesus, we ask you to come into our life. We ask you to take up residence and, and, to, and to live with us. And, and even though we don't understand what that fully means, we want you to be part of our life. Mm -hmm. And we, we ask that, that you would show us the way of life that, that we can have knowing Jesus. We ask that you would become our hope and that you would help us to stop uh, focusing and, and setting our, our eyes on, on these things around us that take away our hope. Uh, we pray that you would help us to take our mind off our past and all the, the, the things in life that we could look at that we could say are, are going wrong or, or aren't going well enough. And we, we ask that you would give us a hope uh, in, in you, that, that you can give us a hope that can be found in life with you, that you would show us the way for living with you. Help us to live with you. We believe in the name of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. as the Son of God, we believe that you, that you died on the cross for our sins, and you, you took the punishment for, for uh, sins and wrongs that we committed, and you did it so that mm -hmm. we could have new life. Yes. You defeated death. You rose from the grave. You showed us that there is an eternal hope that we can live for, and that one day we're going to be reunited with you in heaven. Mm -hmm. And we, we want that life. We want to live for you. We, yes. we want our, our purpose and our way of living to be for Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we ask that you help us. And, and if, we're, if we're at some point in the middle on that journey and, and, and there's, there's stuff going on in life that's got our eyes off of you, uh, if, if you're that person, uh, we, we ask that, that Jesus, you would re-engage our hope that you would reignite it and that you would help us to stop looking at, at the turbulent waters around us and set our eyes back on you. You're, you're the one that can cause us to walk on water, so to speak, and, and to rise above uh, these things that are trying to sink us. And, uh, and just spiritually speaking, I just, I, I want to ask you right now to just reach out your hand towards Jesus and say, Jesus, I just want you to grab my hand and lead me forward. 
-hmm. Help lead me out of this place where I feel like I'm sinking. Mm -hmm. Renew my hope. Mm -hmm. Renew it. Thank you, Lord. Father, for for that one that is wrestling with uh, a specific impurity, I pray that you will help them to see um, that in conjunction with who you are, that it's just a little thing. You can deliver them, and you are delivering them. I pray, Father, that they would not be discouraged, that they would be strengthened in you as they set their eyes on you, the author, perfecter, and finisher of their faith. Yes. The mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, if you prayed one of those prayers, I, I just want you to throw an amen into the comments right right now and, and just just make a public declaration that, man, you agree with that, that you want Jesus to be the way and that, that he's speaking to you tonight. Um, I want to invite you as well, if you live in the area, to come and join us for church on Sunday. Um, we recently transitioned from having two services on Sunday morning to combine them back into one service. So we have one service at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Uh, you can join us in person or we, we do live stream our services to both Facebook and YouTube. So you can join us online if, if that's what you prefer or that's what you need at this time. Um, but we, we'd love to invite you to join us. Uh, we do have a kids, a kids group that, that goes on during our 10 a.m. service. So uh, if, if you have children from the age of, of uh, being out of diapers up through, I think, about 11 or 12, uh, they can come and participate in the kids group that goes on, the children's church, and, and uh, they'll have a great time, and then, then you can come and join us in the sanctuary, and, and uh, uh, we'd love to see you. I also hear that we started up nursery. We so if they're still in diapers, you can have them go into the nursery if you if you need to be able to just take a break and be able to focus on what God can do for you and to hear his word, we do have uh, excellent nursery workers that can take care of your children during that time. That's right. So yeah. we, we, we've got that all covered now. So yeah. thank mm -hmm. you, Jesus. So yeah, uh, we'd love to have you join us. If you can't make it, we'd, we'd love to see you join us again next Wednesday as well for our next Wednesday night Bible study. So God bless you all. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you soon. Take care, folks.